song we're going to sing is entitled Dihambe Now Chikowa, which means um, in English, or oh, let me walk with you, Lord. We're going to sing it in Kosa, and you can follow in English. Uh, this will be projected for you on the screen and on the live, on live stream. blessings and they come in many different uh, forms many different ways and today we have a special blessing we have uh, this symposium which is beginning the uh, beginning of this symposium and we know that we are going to receive a rich blessing from uh, from the Lord as we participate in um, this symposium we want to welcome each one of you. We welcome students. We want to welcome uh, staff members, lecturers. We welcome also people from the community who have uh, come to join us. We feel that uh, you have graced us with your presence, and we want to appreciate that. We also want to welcome the online present, I mean, our congregation, the audience that is online, and um, we know that you will also receive a blessing. I want to also welcome our presenters. Um, we have uh, Professor Moskala uh, and uh, Professor Reeve. And um, I don't know whether I should ask them to stand. Maybe, well, <laughs> maybe I should. This is uh, uh, Professor Moskala and uh, uh, Professor Reeve from uh, the Theological Seminary at Andrews, our flagship, I think, in, our, in, our, in terms of theology. Uh, one of our uh, top institutions. And we feel blessed to have uh, both of you uh, visit with us here. Uh, the two of them have been uh, at Andrews for quite a while. Uh, I actually have interacted with them uh, uh, in, in one way or another. And whenever I see Professor Moskala, I, um, you know, I, I, I sit at his feet at some, at some point. Um, and um, when I also look at uh, John Reeve, I, I remember that uh, he, was, he was ahead of me in classes. He was already doing his PhD 
uh, and I was still a bit back. I took some classes with, uh, with his wife as well. She, she is a theologian in her own right, and she is uh, a lecturer also at Andrews University uh, in the theology faculty. I learned recently that um, Professor Moscala has a daughter who is also in theology, so it looks like this thing runs in the blood. Uh, and uh, she is a theologian in her own right. And without uh, wasting much time, I want to say welcome to our campus, welcome to gracing our, our institution and also our faculty of theology. And uh, tonight, the presentation will be done by uh, Professor Moscala. Um, I believe we're going to have a special song. Not a special song. We're going to have some music. But any song is special anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. So we'll give it over to the praise team. Let us, let us all stand together and sing a special song as we gather. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy shall never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, Lord, great is thy faithfulness. You have called us by your Spirit into worship. In the temple you have set our hearts aflame. As we lay our hearts upon your holy altar, Jesus' name, we'll be blessed in Jesus' name, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercy shall never come to an end, they are
Dear Heavenly Father, I want to come before you at this moment in time, and I just want to say thank you, dear Lord. Thank you for bringing us through the week. Thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. Dear Lord, thank you for the grace that you instill in us each and every day. Dear Lord, as we open up with this symposium, I pray that you might be able to just be with the speakers, dear Lord. Thank you for sending them to us. Dear Lord, you have inspired them with a very special message for us to hear. And as they share this message, I pray that you might be able to guide them and lead them in your words and and in thought, dear Lord. I pray that you might be able to be with us as we listen to the message. Dear Lord, open up our hearts to receive what we are about to give, dear Lord. I pray that you might be able to just stand in our place and that you might provide us with wisdom. Help us understand what we are about to hear. And that we might not only understand this, but that we might be able to start using what we learn in our practical lives and that we might share it with others. Thank you for this opportunity. And I pray that you might be able to truly bless this weekend as we enter into this amazing service. Dear Lord, I pray that your presence may be felt in this place and that the Holy Spirit may dwell in you. This is my prayer in your heavenly name, dear Lord. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great joy for me and uh, for my colleague uh, John Reeve to be with you. Uh, And um, uh, this is um, uh, powerful. I don't know for how many years ago I was here, uh, probably twice already, and now my third, uh, third visit. So I am glad to be with you and to study the Word of God. Well, it's Friday night, right? Are you still fresh to study? (laughs) Um, uh, Well, I have to tell you that I like Friday nights because Friday nights um, are the beginning of the Sabbath. In my family in the past and also in my present family, Friday nights is a special occasion when you have the best table and the best food <laughs> and the beginning you welcome the Sabbath day um, and um, yeah, you know Friday night is good because work is done and if it is not done it will wait right and we can now rest in Christ so I, I am thrilled that we can start our symposium on biblical hermeneutics And uh, when we speak about biblical hermeneutics, you know that it is about the interpretation of scriptures. Okay, and I don't want to, um, you know, um, to now go into the theory of what is hermeneutics and so on, but I would like to go with you to one particular study. I will go to study with you one word. Word you know very well. But I am not sure if you understand that word very well. (laughs) So I am here in order to help you to steer your thinking. And you tell me at the end if um, really you learn something more. And the key word is for tonight, grace. Grace. We, We know that word very well, right? And we speak about amazing grace. And we also speak about blazing um, uh, grace of God. Yes, God's grace is amazing, that's for sure. And uh, why it is amazing? Because you cannot really comprehend completely what you have there. Um, You know, we sing this um, song, Amazing Grace. Everybody knows, correct? And why we say it's uh, amazing? Because God is able to save a wretch like me. me. We are all fragile. Well, I have to come to you closer because I see that every church is the same. You always start from the back, you know. (laughs) And I want to be with you. I want to discuss with you. Uh, So, amazing grace. But, um, you know, for me, this grace is amazing because 
of the special feature. And I will come uh, to it later on. It's not only, it is great that um, grace is able to save me, save you, the wretch like I am. You know, we are all broken, all fragile, and God's grace can put us together. This is great. This is amazing. It's a blasting, you know. But um, you know that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, great um, evangelical scholar, he spoke about um, evangelicals that they take this costly grace and make it as a cheap grace. Why he said it is cheap grace for us very often? Because we say, I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. And we do not follow as it should be. So it's grace without following, without faithful following. So uh, Apostle Paul uh, speaks about, uh, and I know that it's, the script is very small, about immeasurable riches of his grace, of God's grace. It is in Ephesians, um, and it is um, uh, written in um, the very beautiful passage, if you go with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, he speaks about the immeasurable riches of God's grace. What kind of grace? Immeasurable. And it is rich. So if you think, coming here, that you already know what is grace, Paul is telling you, don't think so. Because you cannot actually comprehend it. It's always beyond what we think. And this is beautiful. You know, God's grace, it cannot be caught. Cannot be put into the box. Cannot be defined. And this is period. It's always three dots there. It's more than we can really comprehend. So it is immeasurable um, uh, grace and this um, Greek word um, it can be also translated differently. I will, um, uh, I have some, uh, you know, uh, in small script uh, the, the text like um, um, exceedingly riches of his grace or greatness of his grace, surpassing riches of his grace, the incomparable riches of his grace, the incredible wealth of his grace. You see, it's beyond our um, uh, definitions. It's always bigger, greater, larger than we put into the box of our thinking. The experience with God's grace can be always growing and growing, and there is no end to it. Amen? This is powerful, right? So let's uh, now reflect more on um, uh, this um, um, riches, um, big riches of God's grace. And I would like to um, uh, tell you that uh, God's grace is like a diamond. And this diamond, as you know, has different um, sides. And this, uh, this shape is so beautiful. From different perspectives, you can see different things. And then at the end, what is the most important is that the light comes, right, in the diamond. And it shines so powerfully, so beautifully. So I would like to give you some sides. It will be seven, because seven is a number of perfection, right? So I would like to give you seven sides of God's grace to see how rich it is, how we can grow in the experience of God's grace. So let's, um, let's go on, on our journey. Um, first, I would like to say that um, grace is something what we define as undeserved gift from God. Correct? We cannot um, merit that. It's unmerited, undeserved gift of God. It is gift, right? So um, when we say that, uh, that um, it is undeserved favor uh, from the loving God that we cannot deserve it, it also means that um, it is something shocking for us. Because we like to deserve things. And here God's grace is something 
you actually cannot deserve. And uh, even though I said that I will speak today about seven different phases, phases of God's grace, uh, God's grace is only one. <laughs> only one. And this one God's grace, this diamond, has these different beautiful sides I would like to explore with you. And as I said, there are no prerequisites for receiving grace. Amen? No prerequisites for receiving grace. Can you imagine that? No prerequisites. There is no preconditions from our sides to receive God's grace. It is a gift, undeserved, unrestricted gift. It does not depend on our performance or achievement. It is given freely. We are all sinners and we cannot change it. The only power who can change it is God's grace. Okay? Change comes from above. We need the regeneration, as Jesus said to Nicodemus. You need to be born. And in um, uh, Greek is the word anothen. And this word anothen does not mean only again, but from above. So you need to be born from above. It is not, again, your performance. It is um, the gift from God. So no incentives are needed in order that God will give you His grace. God is giving freely, undeservedly. We need to do what? Grasp it! Take it for ourselves. This is the, our part. So, um, uh, God's act independently on our attitudes, works, and sinfulness. God is a free agent, and He wants to give everybody this uh, grace, which is undeserved. So, uh, how does God's grace uh, uh, really work in our lives? And I would like to tell you that the first word we need to recognize that God is so generous that he gives his grace to everyone in the physical sense. Amen. So if you think about physicality of our existence, this is actually the result of God's grace already. Okay? And um, I can prove it to you, uh, and um, the screen is so small that you cannot read, but if you open with me Psalm 145, verse 9... You will read the following. The Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has made. Okay. In um, uh, the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus Christ was uh, preaching. And what he said, that God is giving um, sunshine and rain and life to how many people? To all without reserves, right? And therefore you be, he said at the end, you be as perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. God is giving grace to everybody. And uh, you probably uh, remind yourself, um, you, you can um, uh, recall that Daniel said to Belshazzar, uh, the king Belshazzar, Babylonian king, you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. You see? Or on the Paul in Acts 17 in the Areopagus in Athens, he was preaching and what he said? Uh, that God is um, having us in his hands, even our breath, our own existence. So I will not go into this more. And this grace which God is giving freely to everybody, and this is that physical grace, how we call it? We call it as universal or common grace. Universal grace. Okay. All right, so this is physical life. God is giving grace to everybody whom they want to sustain, and there is a purpose in sustaining life in order that people can come and uh, know him personally. But uh, from this uh, now common universal grace, we need to go to the 
uh, bigger to the spiritual life, right? And how do we call that grace which leads us to spiritual life? How we call it? Can you tell me? In order that you can be saved. Um, uh, how we call this grace? So this is a common grace first. Everybody is receiving it. And now this grace needs to grow in our life, right? So um, this common grace must to change for what? You see, now we are already waiting what is going on, right? So how we can live spiritual life? How? Open with me um, now the... Um, uh, Epistle of Paul of uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and read for, uh, for yourself verse 1 to 3 very quickly. What do you have there? That we in our spiritual life when we are without Christ we are what? We are dead. We are dead in our sins and in our transgressions. So how the dead person can live, tell me. How the dead person, we, we live physical life, okay, but spiritually we are dead, we are alienated from God. We are alienated from God. So how the dead person can now live? And you know that the, the dead person did not hear even, right? Yes, sir. If you're dead, you are dead. You have no emotions, you have no dreams, you have no work, you are dead. And this is now that miracle. We are talking about God's grace. Then how is it that the dead person can be alive? It is by God's grace that the person can be made alive. If you continue into verse 4... The verse 4 starts with a very small word, but. Okay, and this but changes everything. And beside the but is what? Paul is talking about God's grace. That in Christ we can be made alive. Alright, so if we know that, then in Christ we are made alive. So how it is done in reality? Well, in reality, is that the word of God is coming to us, right? The message about Him, who He is, um, uh, that He is our Creator, He died for us. And with the message uh, to us, even though we are now corpses and we are dead, with that comes God's grace, which is awakening us. This word of God brings life to us. And we have now. Uh, capacity to respond to God's calling. And we can uh, respond positively or negatively. So how we call now this uh, grace which comes with this preaching of the word of God and with the work of the Holy Spirit on our heart. How we call this grace? And this is uh, now, the, in theology, a very important word. And I am so sorry that maybe you did not uh, even heard this word. But it's so crucial word. And uh, let me put it here on the screen. How we call this grace? Prevenient grace. I know, now is a big theological word. But it's very simple. Prevenient, it's come from Latin. Uh, prevenire, and it um, uh, means like something which comes first, something which comes before your salvation. Okay? Before your salvation. You are dead, and God's word with this um, empowering grace, okay, is coming to you and it's awakening you. It's, um, you know, giving you now the capacity to say yes or no to God. And this we call prevenient, prevenient grace. And this is very Im important, you know, to really understand. So, prevenire means 
come before, come first, preceding, anticipating, expecting something which is uh, going on. You know, the best text for it in uh, the Bible, from my perspective, is in in, um, Philippians chapter 2. Please now open uh, your Bible in Philippians chapter 2, and let's read verse 13. I uh, hope that you know that text by heart, because uh, this text is actually telling us how we, even though we are dead, and we are slaves to sin, and we love sin, we, the cycle now can be broken, and something new can come. And uh, how it is done? Well, by God's grace. So let's read it. For it is my concentration, right? It is my achievement. It is my work. It is my uh, performance. No. It is what? It is God. It is God who works where? For you? Or beside you, he's working also in you. Okay? So God is working in you. What does it mean, tell me, that God is working in you? And now it's that both. He's, when he's working in you, he's doing both. And what is this both? He is awakening your will that you want now to serve this God who was revealed to you that is good, that is beautiful, that is uh, your creator, he is your redeemer, and you want to serve him. So this is the first thing, that you will. And second is, that you do. Both things are there. So you, it's not, uh, the grace of God is not coming only for you to do things. First, you need to be willing to do the things. Okay? And God is enabling you. This grace of God, this prevenient grace can be called enabling grace. Okay? This is the same word. You know, give you the capacity to respond. It's enabling you to say yes to God. So, first of all, this prevenient grace is awakening your will. But uh, you can want as much <laughs> as you want <laughs> uh, to do goodwill, and still you will be not able to do this, uh, these good things. Because we are, what? We are sinners. And sinners produces what? Sin. Apple tree produces apples. Fig tree produces figs. Sinner produces sin. So you are not able to do good things by yourself in spiritual sense. What Jesus said, without me, you can do what? Okay. And I can do all things in that spiritual life through Christ who strengthened me. So it is not in us that power. It must come from outside. And this is what we call prevenient grace. Amen? Amen. Beautiful. So, maybe you never heard about prevenient grace, but, and you wonder how is it that uh, we as dead persons, as slaves to sin, we can uh, be saved. So, before we are saved, God is giving this uh, uh, common grace, this universal general grace, and then is giving this new capacity, new ability that we can respond to his call of love, even though we are dead. Now, he, he is the one who is now making us alive. The word of God is coming. God is making that first step. He is the initiator. And now it's coming to us, and we can be awakened. And now it's upon us, because we have this will now to say yes, Oh, no. And when we say yes, he is going even deeper. He is now enabling us to do, not only to will, but also to do. So, 
please put this, uh, you know, text in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 13 in golden color in your Bible or in red because it is so crucial. It's explained to you how we can do different new things. All right. So um, from that perspective, everything uh, what God is doing before our salvation is in service of that prevenient grace. Correct? Even this uh, common general grace is in um, uh, service of that prevenient grace. God is giving physical life. He is um, uh, taking care of whatever is needed for our life. And then he is also taking care of the spiritual things that we can be awakened. All right, so this is that um, prevenient grace. Uh, now we understand what is prevenient grace, all right? Uh, so you can say enabling grace, okay? Empowering grace. This is all the, the same. So what is number, phase number three now? What is after that? I already mentioned that, but uh, uh, let's say it because it is uh, grace which is coming before. Before of what? Before of salvation, of course. So the third phase of God's grace is um, saving grace of God. When you say yes to God because he enables you to say it, then you are saved. When you believe in Christ Jesus and you accept him as your personal savior, as um, you know, bad was your previous life, doesn't matter. If you openly, um, sincerely, honestly confess your sins, he is faithful to uh, forgive all your sins and iniquity. Glory, hallelujah, Hosanna. Now we can jump, right? So we are saved. And when we are saved, we can be very grateful. It means we can be really happy. So I'm always saying, Seventh-day Adventists cannot have faces from uh, north to south. They have to have faces from east to west. Seventh-day Adventist Christians must be the most happy people because they know that they are saved in Christ Jesus and they have the full assurance in Christ Jesus. But I have to tell you, this, this is not the end of the story. And I can tell you plenty of biblical texts, and you can see, and you can later on read um, my article on, on this issue. So uh, this is not, not the point that you need to now um, have all this, um, these details. But I want that you understand the concept, the, the greatness of God's grace, and what he is doing for your and my life. So after that is that saving grace. And saving grace is redeeming us, saving, forgiving all our sins. But is the end of the story now here? So, you know, God is giving me the general grace, physical, then give, uh, awakens me. Uh, this is the prevenient grace. And then he saves me. So period, right? Enough. Glory, hallelujah, Hosanna, let's dance. Is it the end of the story? Let me tell you that now comes um, more than, uh, than that. And what is it? And this is uh, that what I um, uh, see why God's grace is amazing. God's grace is amazing not because he's able to save a wretch like me, but God's grace is amazing because God's grace can change a wretch like me. And this is what is now what I would like to speak about the transforming grace of God. Amen? Amen. We can be new people. We are new creature in Christ Jesus. There are beautiful consequences. This grace of God is working in us. And we are new people. These selfish people, uh, self-centered, you know, um, always grabbing things for, for um, uh, us. These people can be different. They can think about other people first than themselves. 
and this is completely, uh, you know, change of thinking, change of um, um, behavior, and everything what we are doing in our life. So this um, transforming grace of, of God. But um, uh, God's grace is doing also um, uh, something else. When you are saved and you are transformed, so you are now, you will do what? You will live in your living room, enjoying life on the canopy, no? And saying, yes, Lord, I am saved, you change me, I am waiting for your second coming period. No. When you are saved and you are transformed, now you are thinking about other people, right? How to tell them this good news about Jesus, about God. So now God's grace is enabling you to do this witnessing, okay? To do these great things for him. And uh, this is um, um, the face of God's grace number five. Empowering grace. You know, equipping grace, better maybe to say even. Equipping grace for effective service and witnessing for God. And for that you need to have spiritual gifts, right? And the spiritual gifts can only perform if you received the fruit of the Spirit. And if you have the fruit of the Spirit and you are full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and compassion, and humility, what the Holy Spirit is giving. So in that setting now, God is uh, empowering you, equipping you with His gifts in order that you can come and go and serve, and boldly serve without complex of inferiority, because you know that you are now the daughter or son of God. Amen? So after that comes what? What is the phase number? What comes after that? When God is empowering you and you are serving other people, what is still missing? What we need more? What we need more? And I would like to say this is... Um, or sustaining grace. You need to persevere, right? It's uh, not only, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, to marry Christ. You need to now stay married with Christ. And what is uh, more, uh, more important, to marry or to stay married? <laughs> what is easier? To marry, of course, I can marry every second day if I want. But to stay married, this is the art of life. Okay? And more I stay married with my wife, more I enjoy it. Every day is more and more beautiful. You know? And this is, for, for that you need this sustaining grace of God. What is the characteristic of the people who believe in the three angel message? In Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, how it starts? The, here is the patience, or you can translate perseverance of the saints. He is that perseverance. And this is only possible because of God's grace. It's not your performance, it's not your achievement. It's not that you are now focusing well and, and you have these uh, good experiences so you continue in the good routine. No, it's only because of God's grace. Amen. God is that power from the very beginning till the end in your life that you can live the beautiful Christian Seventh-day Adventist dedicated life to God. There is no other way. He who started the work in us will be able also to finish it, to accomplish it, to prepare us for that day of the second coming of Jesus. Okay, and now the number seven, what is what? Is what? What is this grace of God? 
All right, what, what will be the good world? When God is now giving us, you know, victory over our addictions. Do you need a victory over addictions? I need that. Do you need um, victory on, uh, to be free of slavery of sin? I need that. Uh, you know, sin is terrible power. Terrible power. And we need that power. And this uh, power is giving us victory. And how we can say this victory in different way? That God is giving us by His grace the triumph of victory, right? So I would like to call this uh, phase number seven triumphant grace. Brings victory over sin, victory over temptations, victory over, you know, our inclinations. It gives victory over addictions to sin. We are liberated. We are free. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We don't uh, need to and we don't have to now follow and always complain. Yes, we have to stay always connected, but uh, He is the one who is giving us victory day after day. And if we fall, He is ever again able to lift us up and give us again a new victory to start again and again and continue. Amen? This is that beauty of God's grace. So this is a triumphant grace. And this um, triumphant grace is not only, you know, triumphant for this day and for tomorrow, but it will triumph at the second coming of Jesus. And this will be the triumph of all triumphs because this will be the final day when Jesus will take us up to himself. So, all right, seven, seven phases of God's grace. It's perfect, right? Seven must be perfect. Can we, re can we remember that? First, common grace or general grace. Second, prevenient grace. Then, saving grace. Then, transforming grace. Then, empowering, equipping, then sustaining grace, and finally, triumphant, when we go from victory to victory. Now, when you are saved by God's grace and you all experience this, what is the result of it? What is the result? If you experience this grace in your life, so what will be the outward expression of it? And it's very simple. And the simple is that actually uh, this um, uh, God's um, uh, grace is bringing us that we serve other people. Good work! Good work! Good work! <laughs> is the fruit of God's grace in our life. But um, before I will go to um, a few minutes uh, to, to speak about uh, this um, uh, fruit of, the, um, uh, of God's grace, let me ask you, do we as Seventh-day Adventists believe in irresistible grace? You know that uh, people around us are speaking, uh, especially those who are in the um, uh, you know, Calvinistic um, uh, confessions, they are speaking about irresistible grace of God. Can you resist God's grace or not? If God is giving your grace, it's given to you if you want or not. Yes, and uh, we do not, as Seventh-day Adventists, believe in irresistible grace. Because as I said before, we can, when God's grace comes to us, we can say yes or no. And um, unfortunately... Unfortunately, even we received God's grace, we can, in the time, say again no to God because we are free agents, okay? He is enabling us to say yes or no. This is why we need sustaining grace to persevere in our walk with Christ. So we do not believe in irresistible grace as we do not believe one safe always saved, okay? We believe once saved, always staying, walking with Christ. This we believe, okay? 
but we do not believe one saved, always saved. We believe one saved, now stay married with Christ. Walk with him. Enjoy your life with him. And um, as um, uh, you know if you are married or not, so I know if I am married or not. So in this way you can know if you are in Christ or not in Christ. If I will say it simply, you know, I don't need to wake up in the morning and think, hmm, am I married or not? Because I know that I am married, right? Uh, I know that never, I did not um, divorce my wife. I uh, eat with her, sleep with her, play with her, talk with her, uh, do m m with her many things. So I am with her. I know that I am married with my wife. In the same way, I don't need to wake up in the morning and think, hmm, am I saved or not? Because I know if I gave my life to him, to Jesus or not. And if I do my decisions in my life with him or not. You know, the first thing in the morning, what I do, even going to the bathroom, I kneel down by my bed. And what I say, Lord, thank you for the gift of life. And I give myself into your hands. Please, by your grace, lead me, change me, transform me. And uh, fill me with your Holy Spirit that I can be a blessing. And during the day, I have conversations with, with my Lord. And in the evening, what I do before I go to bed? Again, I kneel down and I say, Lord, if I did something wrong, please reveal to me. Tell me clearly. And if I am convinced, uh, convicted by the Holy Spirit, I do not uh, leave it to the next day. I right away confess, right? Lord, maybe I did really something wrong. I, I should not say this word to my brother or my sister. Maybe my... Uh, my expression was not right. Uh, 